The Lexus RCF offers a deliciously different option to buyers in the high-performance Super Coupe segment dominated by cars like BMW's M4. Like its rivals, there's a classic front-engine rear-wheel drive setup, but this contender pairs that with a spectacular old-school normally aspirated 5-litre V8 offering a soundtrack to die for. It's not an agile track car, but on the road, a great experience lies in store. What exactly does the Lexus brand mean to you? In all probability, its very name conjures up images of ecocentric luxury. Petrol electric hybrids for plutocrats, wood and leather with a green conscience. What you're unlikely to picture is something like this, a car like the Lexus RCF. Maybe though, that's because you don't know Lexus quite as well as you think you do. The company doesn't, you see, only employ enviro-conscious engineers or experts purely dedicated to ruffling leather and trimming worn-up veneer. Some of them are out-and-out petrol heads. People like Yaguchi-san and Sakamoto-san. History records that for years these two badgered their bosses to use their brand's technological might for red mist motoring as well as luxurious efficiency. The silky smooth petrol V8s the brand was bonding to hybrid power could surely be let off the leash once in a while, couldn't they? Shouldn't Lexus be taking on the Germans at their own game? It was an argument that appealed to the Lexus board, and the result in 2008 was the ISF Super Saloon, a storming and rather individual 5-litre V8-powered rival for models like BMW's M3 and the Mercedes C63 AMG. Relatively few were sold, but the car was good enough to establish performance credentials that were further proved when the company's LFA supercar was launched to much acclaim in 2009. Unfortunately, the ISF remained a rare sight on our roads, while the LFA lost Lexus money, despite its lottery winner's price tag. What the company really needed to do was to take its newfound engineering expertise and apply it to something with wider appeal, to a performance car accessible and affordable enough for many more people to enjoy. A car like this one? Perhaps. It's based on the brand's RC Coupe, a car primarily targeted at American tastes, but also developed for Europe with smaller, more efficient turbocharged power. That kind of engine is the sort of thing buyers now expect, even in the most potent real-world performance cars. It's certainly what's delivered by the most direct rival this RCF must face, BMW's M4. Lexus, though, doesn't simply copy the Germans anymore, and instead has simply uprated the old ISF's normally aspirated old-school V8 for this model, though paired it with a quite astonishing array of driver technology. It all leaves us posing this car a whole series of searching questions. Have we here the sort of engine still relevant in the modern world? And if it is, are buyers now ready to take Lexus seriously as a manufacturer of top draw sports cars? It's time to find out. <laughs> So, what's it like? An experience, to be sure. You settle into the high-mounted wing-backed racing-style seat, grasp the chunky three-spoke F-Sport steering wheel and brush your brogues against the drilled steel pedals. Now, there are only two of these because all RCF models must have auto transmission, an eight-speed sports direct shift set up with steering wheel change paddles. An auto box is the only way of properly harnessing the prodigious torque from the fiery beast that beats beneath the bonnet. A revised 471 brake horsepower version of the same 5 litre V8 that powered this car's ISF predecessor. Prod the starter button and it bursts menacingly into life. You're ready. 
that V8 is old school in character, heavy, sonorous, and perhaps most significantly normally aspirated in an era where almost all of this car's rivals favor turbocharged or supercharged forced induction. If you're familiar with one of these competitors, this RCF will feel very different, lacking a turbo model's instant surge of low-end torque. Perhaps a few figures will better illustrate the point. Whereas, say, a BMW M4 develops all of its 550 newton meters of pulling power from just 1800 RPM, this Lexus can't give you all it's got until the engine's singing all the way up at 4800 RPM. And though all it's got is 66 brake horsepower more than the BMW in terms of braked horses, this RCF actually has less to offer when it comes to the all-important question of torque, 530 newton meters, which on paper is a problem given that this car is a quarter of a ton heavier than its Bavarian rival. That's also the main reason why this RCF isn't the track car Lexus would like it to be. It would be hard enough to disguise all that extra bulk on a circuit if an instantly responding twin turbo was beating beneath the bonnet. With a hulking great conventional V8 installed up front, this model's fate is sealed. It simply can't be as light on its feet and as quick fire to the response of your right foot as its more agile forced induction rivals. Motoring writers who've driven this car have berated it for this, which seems to me rather foolish. Didn't they realise from a glance at the spec sheet that this Lexus was trying to be different? Do they want every model in this class to be an M4 clone? And in any case, who exactly are all these track day fiends who've the time, the inclination and the tyre budget to habitually pound their pricey purchases around on track days? I've yet to meet one. So, time to press the reset button in your head and ready yourself instead to enjoy this car for what it is, not for what you might be told to expect it to be. And what it is offers up a delicious, involving, and in many ways spectacular experience. Key to that is the fantastic soundtrack inspired by the ballistic LFA model, properly angry and utterly un-Lexus. Give the V8 its head and you get all sorts of pops and crackles on the overrun too. It has to be one of the best sounding engines in any sports coupe this side of supercar money. Maybe the best. There's just the tiniest bit of cheating going on here though. The exhaust, the intake and the mechanical sounds you hear are all being enhanced by an active sound control system that adapts the oral firework display to suit the way that you're driving, selectively playing what Lexus calls auxiliary sound through a speaker located beneath the instrument panel. This note changes in response to engine speed and throttle movement with a steady deep tone up to 3000 RPM that then blends into a higher pitch roar as the revs increase. It's awfully done and without prior knowledge, you'd attribute no shenanigans to the whole process. Just settle back and enjoy it. No, better than that, go and experience the soulless technical scream of a BMW M4, then come back to this car. You'll be ready then to appreciate it all the more. Active sound control, I should point out, works only in the fieriest of the five operating modes available through the Sports Direct Shift Transmission Standard Drive Mode Select System. This defaults to its normal setup on startup. There's a snow option to limit wheel spin in bad weather, and for those occasions on which you're feeling virtuous, an eco setting is provided that restricts engine output and throttle response, replacing the rev counter for a blue eco driving indicator. It's the two serious driving modes you'll really want to try though. Twist the silver rotary controller next to the gear stick to select Sport S and signs that the character of the car is about to change are delivered from the stunning LFA supercar derived dial pack in front of you. This mode recalibrates the big RPM gauge, adds in a rev indicator light system and gives prominence to the gear shift display over the speedo. 
Dynamically, it uses information from the car's G-sensors to select the ideal gear ratio for any situation of spirited driving. Better still, the transmission will automatically downshift during hard braking for a corner, hold a lower gear through the bend for greater control, and then uh, select a suitable low gear on the exit of the turn to give you greater throttle response. The same G-sensor even senses when the car goes light over a crest and ramps up braking pressure to help you control things on the other side. Brilliant. Should you be minded to push this car even harder, there's the further temptation of an ultimate Sport Plus mode. You won't be able to resist trying it because it activates the sonorous active sound control system I was talking about earlier. At the same time, also changing the dash with a bar type tachometer to make engine speed instantly readable and a centimetre display that adds water and oil temperature readouts. Dynamically, there are quicker downshifts and firmer steering. But most significant is the way that Sport Plus brings into play a system Lexus engineers are very proud of, VDIM, or Vehicle Dynamics Integrated Management. Now, as buyers loyal to the brand might know, VDIM is a setup that's long been used by the company to seamlessly integrate the electronic braking traction and stability control functions on its cars. In the RCF, though, the driver can tweak it, relaxing the stability and traction mapping for a little more leeway. So, in the Sport Plus drive mode select setting I'm in now, the VDIM automatically knows you're likely to be throwing this car about and relaxes the stability and traction control mapping in its Sport setting. If you do ignore my earlier observations and perhaps understandably succumb to the temptation to hoon this thing around a track, there's a further, more focused VDIM mode, Expert. This disengages all the electronic assistance, so for example you can flick the back of the car out, uh, though keeps a layer of protection in extremis to prevent the embarrassment of an actual spin should ambition get the better of your talent. If you really don't want that, you can completely turn VDIM off, but I'd strongly advise against it. This is, after all, a very quick car indeed. 62 miles an hour for rest is dealt with in only four and a half seconds, and the 400 meter mark flashes by in just 12 and a half seconds. More importantly, the 50 to 75 mile an hour overtaking increment takes just three and a half seconds. In perspective, we're talking of a coupe that's a fraction slower than that rival BMW or a Mercedes AMG C63, but a fraction faster than, say, a Porsche Cayman GTS or a Jaguar F Type V6S. We're not talking here of Nissan GTR or Porsche 911 Turbo Pace, but it's still plenty fast enough to qualify for the performance top table, without in this case the restriction of the pointless 155 mile an hour speed limiter that most of the German brands still saddle their road racers with. Get an RCF on the hangar straight at Silverstone or an unrestricted autobahn and you'll be going to 168 miles an hour. For all the reasons I've previously given, the Autobahn represents this car's greater comfort zone. Perhaps that's why you can't specify it with common track-style features found in most rivals, things like ceramic brakes and launch control. I'm fine with that, given the more road-orientated remit, but given this, it's a bit surprising to find the kind of adjustable damping that allows you to tweak the ride of far cheaper cars nowhere on the menu for this one. I mentioned braking, here at least is one feature of this car that is track ready. The big 19 inch alloys allow space for some serious Brembo stoppers. That's one of the things suggesting that somewhere buried away in this design is a leaner, more focused circuit racer trying to get out. Another is a feature you simply have to have if you're serious about buying this car, the TVD torque vectoring differential that's optional on this standard model but included on the top carbon version. Now don't be confused, the standard RCF gets a simpler differential setup, a straightforward Torsen limited slip system 
that distributes torque between the rear wheels to optimise cornering traction. The TVD torque vectoring differential, though, goes much further, subtly improving handling by spinning the outside wheel faster through corners in the drive, pinning you to the road like an unseen hand and firing you from bend to bend. Other manufacturers offer cruder such systems that'll function via your car's ABS braking setup. With these, though, spinning wheels can only be slowed. The TVD setup's more sophisticated use of precisely controlled multi-plate clutches to vector torque means that such wheels can also, where necessary, be speeded up too, which offers a wider range of dynamic options. So many, in fact, that TVD is able to offer the driver three selectable modes. Yes, more modes. This time, a standard compromise setting, slalom for ultimate agility, and track for high-speed circuit driving. We keep coming back to track references with this car, don't we? Despite realities to the contrary. The engineers were determined that we should. But sometimes you build something with one thing in mind and it emerges as something rather different. Sometimes that thing can even be better. Fall beneath the spell of this car and it'll make a believer out of you. So, do you like it? We do. It looks like what it is, a proper premium high-performance coupe that aims to be a more exclusive choice in a market segment dominated by rivals that are merely pokier, bespoiled derivatives of much humbler models. It's perfect, in other words, if you want to make a statement when it comes to your choice of a car of this kind. You might not want to call it beautiful, but it's certainly extrovert, purposeful and deliciously different. Being different usually means taking a few risks when it comes to design, and sure enough, the huge raised bonnet will divide opinion, as will this massive double spindle front grille, one of the few in current production actually improved by the addition of a large registration plate. This one needed to break up the sheer expanse of the chrome-framed structure. Apertures in the outer corners cool the front brakes, with further grills in the outer extremity of the outer spindle, ducting air to the oil radiators. In fact, this car needs a lot of air management. Even the LEDs that power both the signature headlights and the tick-shaped daytime running lamps need to be cooled by a tiny thermostatically controlled fan to prevent the diodes from overheating. More obvious are the Nissan GTR style outlets in the top of the bonnet and in the wings behind the front wheels that vent air from the engine bay and the brake discs cooling both while also creating strategic low pressure zones that help aerodynamic flow over the stunning rear haunches. Further nice aero touches include stabilising fins that are integrated into the door frame moulding next to the mirrors and the way that the far edges of the front and rear bumpers have been shaped to direct air smoothly along the side of the car. Plus, there are front and rear wheel spats and sculpted wheel arch liners to improve the airflow around the gorgeous 19-inch forged alloy wheels. These, by the way, are a key visual differentiation point between the two main RCF derivatives. Five spoked on this standard model, but featuring twin sets of ten spokes on the pricier carbon version. This top variant, as its name suggests, offers a roof and rear spoiler trimmed in the same kind of carbon fibre finish you'd find similarly applied to a BMW M4. Lexus, though, has gone a stage further and created an even more extrovert look by applying the same treatment to the bonnet. The resulting fast and furious look wouldn't be to our taste, but hey, each to their own. Go for the carbon edition model and you'll have to have a fixed rear wing rather than this standard version's four-link active spoiler, which, providing you're not driving in eco mode, rises at 50 miles an hour before retracting at speeds of under 25 miles an hour. Other products of wind tunnel development include further aero stabilising fins for the engine, the transmission, the floor sections and these rear combination lamps.
and the rear rising floor undercover has rectifying fins to ensure a smooth flow of air away from the underside of the car. A lot of work, in other words, has gone into the detail here, and the result is a notably slippery 0.33 CD drag coefficient. The last word should perhaps be directed to the final thing most will see, as this car thunders past them, these stacked rear tailpipes. Again, aesthetically, they're an acquired taste, but at least they're absolutely genuine, unlike the nasty fake plastic things Lexus used to stick onto the bumper of the old ISF. Is all of this smoke and mirrors there to detract from what underneath it all is a car of considerable bulk? Perhaps. There's no coordinated lightweight design strategy here. The design instead mixing together much of what the development team already had to hand. The front end of the chassis is derived from the brand's large GS saloon with a rear section from the smaller IS four door and a midsection from the old IS convertible. Then there's that big old school V8 beneath the bonnet, its basic blueprint predating the days when engineers poured over every little detail in an effort to trim back weight. So there's plenty of that, this car tipping the scales at a hefty 1,840 kilograms, making it almost 240 kilograms heavier than a rival BMW M4 Coupe. So, it's solid, but then so is the quality you get inside, where the driver-focused theme continues in a cabin again deliciously different to the German class norm in its statement of style. Though much of it is derived from the brand's humbler IS saloon, there's still an agreeably expensive feel, with responsive electrostatic switches to adjust the air conditioning and lovely touches like the metal surround to this analogue clock. It's not ostentatious, and some of the materials are quite varied, but it looks good, unique, cultured and clever, with purposeful touches like this drilled pedal set that includes a usefully large footrest that you'll be bracing yourself against if you're brave enough to be burning through the rubber on track days. You sit rather high, but well supported on the kind of brilliantly figure-hugging wing-back sports seats that rivals would include only as an exorbitantly priced option. Getting comfortable behind the chunky, electrically adjustable, three-spoke F-branded steering wheel is easy, and through it you view a spectacular instrument panel derived from that used in the brand's LFA supercar. The dial pack offers up a large centrally mounted rev counter that changes according to driving mode and offers a digital speed readout to complement the smaller analogue dial placed on the right of the display. Towards the left lies a 4.2 inch TFT screen able to offer up all manner of driving data a differential torque vectoring monitor, a g-force meter, oil and water temperature gauges, mileage information and a stopwatch for clocking that bridge to gantry time at the Nürburgring. Look around and there's little to detract from the high-end theme, unless like me you find the laptop style touchpad controller that controls the infotainment system rather fiddly to get to grips with. Lexus still has a little to learn from the German brands here. Fortunately, there are plenty of compensations. The thumping 17-speaker, 835-watt Mark Levinson stereo system that most owners will specify being one of them, with Clarify technology that, even on arrival at your destination, will leave you pinned to your seat as you savour the last few beats of your favourite track. It's one of the many things that really warms you to this car. In comparison, a BMW M4 feels a couple of classes less polished. As you might well expect, there's not a huge amount of space on the back seats in terms of either head or leg room, but then no car in this class really offers that. At least there are back seats. You don't get them at all on a rival Porsche Cayman or Jaguar F-Type. Out back, boot space is a touch restricted too. The 366 litre total, about 20% down on the capacity you could expect in a rival BMW M4. 
Still, it's more than Jaguar offers in its F-Type Coupe and it's probably just about enough to satisfy this car's GT credentials. Lexus asks around £60,000 of you for a standard RCF. If you'd like the more purposeful look of the slightly lighter carbon version with its torque vectoring differential for sharper corner turning, there's an £8,000 premium to pay. Now, both RCF variants come only with the same hand-built power plant, a 5-litre, 471 brake horsepower petrol V8, matched with an 8-speed Sports Direct Shift auto transmission. As for rivals, well, the obvious one is BMW's M4 Coupe, which has about 10% less power, but the same sort of performance due to its lighter weight. At first glance, the Bavarian car looks slightly cheaper, but by the time you add paddle shift automatic transmission to it to match this RCF spec, it'll cost you almost exactly the same sort of money. Now, if you're making comparisons between the two cars, my comment would be that the M4 is a choice for really serious enthusiasts. An RCF, in contrast, can certainly please such people, but it's been engineered to be enjoyed to the fore by owners with a wider range of skills. But are there other options for those considering this car? Well, a Mercedes-AMG C63 is an obvious pick with price, power output and performance that are all virtually identical to the figures of this RCF. It's not as well equipped as this Lexus though and to many in the street will simply look like nothing more than a sportily trimmed version of a relatively humble Mercedes C-Class. If you're in this market, you'll have to decide whether that bothers you or not. The same kind of issue applies to Audi's ageing RS5 coupe, which again is a match for this Lexus in terms of power and price, though its driving dynamics reach a lesser level. Perhaps a better match for this car are two rivals that offer substantially less power, yet still deliver similar performance and very much the same driver orientated ethos. A Porsche Cayman GTS with PDK auto transmission serves up 340 PS while Jaguar's F-Type Coupe V6S delivers 380 PS. Both require the RCF's same £60,000 budget and both are very desirable. In neither case though do you get the back seats, the greater boot space and much of the luxury of this Lexus or its lovely resonant V8 growl. Your call. If having considered all of this, you conclude that it is an RCF that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Lexus has been when it comes to standard spec. Well, you shouldn't be disappointed. You get these dual-like triple L LED headlights with automatic high beam function, gorgeous 19-inch forged alloy wheels, front and rear parking sensors, electric auto-dimming power-folding heated door mirrors, and keyless smart entry. Inside, there's a 10-speaker multimedia system, including a DAB radio and a DVD player, accessible via the brand's remote touch touchpad control. You also get Lexus premium navigation, dual zone climate control and the drive mode select system so that you can set the car up for the road you're on and the mood you're in via Eco, Sport S and Sport Plus settings. You sit on brilliantly supportive high backed winged sport seats trimmed in butter smooth leather upholstery with electric adjustment, heating and ventilation. And throughout the interior, there's Lexus F-themed detailing to be found on the electrically adjustable steering wheel, the pedals, the seat design, and on various trim elements. That's on top of expected features like cruise control and an auto-dimming rear-view mirror. Try specifying that gear onto, say, a based Porsche 911, and it would easily carry the bill towards six figures. And you know what? you'd still be two cylinders and 125 brake horsepower down on a Lexus RCF. With that in mind, potential buyers of this car might feel able to dip into an options list that lacks two features you might expect to find, adaptive suspension and ceramic brakes. 
Instead, it's headlined by two key items, the thumping 17-speaker Mark Levinson premium hi-fi system and the torque vectoring differential. Ideally, I'd want both, although with these two niceties added, it's worth pointing out that you'd be halfway towards the asking price of the top carbon version that includes them as standard and also adds Alcantara seat trim and trendy CFRP carbon fibre treatment for the roof, the bonnet and rear spoiler. You'll need to be quite an extrovert to carry this particular version off though. Other options are few. It's just a question of deciding whether you want a sunroof, metallic paint and, most importantly, the pre-crash safety system with adaptive cruise control. This uses a radar that's not only designed to keep you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway, but is also able to scan the road ahead as you drive in search of potential collision hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the car will automatically brake itself to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. It's a nice setup to have, but even if you choose to do without it, your RCF will come very well able to look after you if everything goes pear-shaped. Central to its approach is the VDIM Vehicle Dynamics Integrated Management System, which brings together the anti-lock brakes, the traction control, the limited slip diff and the stability electronics to work as one cohesive unit. The system also governing gear shift speed and the degree of electric assistance for the steering. Also standard are things like a blind spot monitor to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake, lane keep assist to stop dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway and headlights that automatically dip themselves at night. More familiar features run to hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and an auto location tire pressure warning system. Should all of that be insufficient to stop you from having an accident, then no fewer than eight airbags will spring to your aid. Twin front, side and curtain bags, plus a driver's knee bag and a front passenger cushion bag. <laughs> Cost of ownership is one of the bigger debating points when it comes to this car. Clearly the weight and relative inefficiency that come with using lusty, old-school, normally aspirated V8 power mean that an RCF starts with quite a disadvantage over its turbocharged rivals. Lexus, though, has done its best to minimise this downside, even engineering the 5-litre unit to switch to a more efficient Atkinson operating cycle at cruising speeds and refettling it to meet Euro 6 emission standards. There's also a green-friendly eco mode in the drive select system that replaces the rev counter with a blue eco driving indicator and tweaks engine output, throttle openings and air conditioning settings to minimise fuel consumption. The result of all this is a useful improvement over the kind of fuel and CO2 figures that the less powerful version of this engine used to produce in Lexus's old ISF model. But as an engineer, there's only so much you can do if your sports coupe has petrol V8 power, 471 braked horses and nearly 1.9 tonnes of weight to carry around. I'll get to the point. This car manages 26.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 251 grams per kilometre of CO2. Arrival BMW M4 in contrast with its smaller twin turbo straight six and quarter ton weight advantage delivers 34 miles to the gallon and 194 grams per kilometre of CO2. Figures almost exactly duplicated by its arch rival, the Mercedes AMG C63. The upshot of all that is that an RCF will sit two tax bands higher than its Teutonic rivals, which will mean that over three years, owners will have to find over £800 more in road tax bills alone than they would have had to in choosing either of these obvious German alternatives. Still, when you're spending this much on a performance car, that kind of premium is hardly likely to be a deal breaker, particularly given that buyers of this Lexus won't have to be forking out for many of the nice to have features that BMW and Mercedes continue to charge extra money for. Anyway, in this Japanese brand's defense, it's worth pointing out that this car's figures are no worse than those of a comparable Audi RS5, and even Jaguar's F-Type V6S Coupe isn't vastly better. 
despite packing 20% less power. In any case, let's not kid ourselves. Any car in this class is going to record some fairly shocking efficiency figures when you plant the loud pedal, and at least when you do so in an RCF, you're awarded with a gloriously majestic soundtrack that for most will be far preferable to the technical scream now served up by a BMW M car. In fact, such is the character of this engine that you really do get something from it when you're just burbling about. An M4 or a C63 feels a tad unhappy at these sorts of speeds, these being cars you need to drive hard to enjoy. This Lexus is different, and I think you might like it. If all of that puts you in the frame of mind to give RCF ownership the benefit of the doubt, then you'll be further cheered by the news that this car's exclusivity will guarantee residual values at least as good as a BMW M4 and better than a Mercedes AMG C63 after the usual three year, 36,000 mile standard ownership period. Insurance is rated at Group 48A for this standard model and Group 50A for the carbon edition, so make sure you can obtain reasonably priced cover before signing up. Otherwise, there's a three year, 60,000 mile warranty for reassurance, a period of cover I'd normally call unremarkable. I won't in this case because this is a Lexus. They don't tend to go wrong, and if they do, you've got the best after sales care in the business to fall back on. Lexus has bought us here a super coupe that's good looking, beautifully built, agreeably rapid, lavishly equipped, and everyday usable. A combination of qualities that its predecessor, the old ISF, never quite nailed. It's properly charismatic too, that amazing sounding 5 litre V8 engine sees to that. This extracts a penalty in terms of efficiency if you're comparing against BMW and Mercedes rivals, but in return you get yourself a road racer that's a far more interesting individualistic choice. Those German alternatives may win all the magazine tests when it comes to this class of car, but that's because the people who write those kinds of stories usually care only for short-term circuit thrills rather than long-term ownership satisfaction. Despite Lexus's protestations, this isn't really a track tool. It's too heavy and perhaps even too luxurious in its approach for that. There are other compensations though. That spectacular engine soundtrack is one, while another is the way the clever electronics will allow a wider range of drivers to get the most from what's on offer. In many rivals, you can only realise the car's full potential if you're an owner with expert skills. In an RCF though, even less experienced folk will feel confident in exploring its potential. Yet it's still a blast. Refreshingly, the clever technology hasn't sanitised the driving experience, but enhanced it. Who'd have thought it would be a demure Lexus of all the brands who would bring us what is one of the most politically incorrect super coupes on general lease, a loud extreme statement of a car. In comparison, it makes competitors like BMW's M4 look dull and compromised. In summary, if you're in the market for something of this kind, I'd urge you to look beyond the press reports and make up your own mind about this RCF. If somebody offered me one of these or a BMW M4 to drive every day for a year, there's no way I'd choose the German car, and I didn't think I'd be saying that before I picked up the keys to this Lexus. It's old school in feel, but new wave in execution, and there has to be room in the market for that combination.